Hello and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday with me, Ryan, aka Sifu Messiah. This is a weekly show which covers everything from the world of Star Citizen over the past week. Links can be found in the description for everything we discuss, so let's get on with it. I'd just like to say a quick thank you to all patrons as you are really helping make these Star Citizen Sunday videos possible. If you are interested in becoming a patron, head over to our Patreon page using the link in the description. Thank you. So like last week's episode of Star Citizen Sunday, this week's going to be a two-parter. There's just too much information coming out too close to Sunday that I just don't have time to get it all in one video. So tomorrow on Monday, part two will be up, which will cover the Genesis Starliner Q&A part two and the monthly report for June. So this week we hear information on the repair mechanic, we talk about the Herald in ship shape, plus we get an FPS update from Chris Roberts. Okay, so kicking off this week's Star Citizen Sunday, we have 10 for the designers. I really like the designers posts. Always so much in-depth knowledge about the game's mechanics. And this week we're focusing on repairing, which is something I'm very interested in doing. I picked out the majority of the questions. The first one being, when repairing, can you choose to leave certain parts damaged? And they say yes. Making sure what you're repairing has direct impact on your ship. And so, say, after a battle, you're not likely to start fixing up your, your ship decals or aesthetics in space. You would probably leave that till you get back to your hangar, so you'd only fix the important things like your power plant or your thrusters. Things that are necessary to get you home safe, which is very cool, so you can leave bits as they are until you get to a place where it's safe to repair them. Next question is, how will ship repairs be accessible to the new player? Is it going to be deep enough to support gameplay focused on repair and rewarding enough of increasing player skills and they say they're making each action small and condensed and basically the repair mechanic or the engineering mechanic will be a series of small actions for example they say you go to the power plant you open it up and you see it's on fire so you've got to get the extinguisher to put out the fire they say identifying the issue is part of the whole process so if you lose shields you could do like a quick fix which is not going to be clear to a noob he would have to go through all the processes of going from one step to the next to get the shield repaired and normal whereas a, a more seasoned mechanic may just know a quick fix to get it working there and then until you get again to safe space and they did say that you can have a terrible but functional shield if you choose to repair critical parts but i said a noob would have to work through each component to get it working so he wouldn't know exactly what the problem could have been and how it could have been addressed quicker and they did say the more time you invest into repair the more it will reward you they didn't specify how but it sounds quite interesting. So next question is, will we have real-time waiting for repairs or building? So sort of more damage equals longer time. And it says, yes, they're currently working on a system now. It's not just for ships. It's a two-layer system, they say. Ships will have so much durability, and that will be its maximum health pool, then its current repair state, which is its sort of current health. And you can repair a ship or a component. Obviously, a component will, will be a lot quicker of an action, maybe a few minutes. And obviously, on bigger ships, it will take a lot longer. But to raise its durability, you would need to take it to a shop which could take days or hours depending on the on the work at hand and this will bring it back to a better durability than than what you could do on your own but they did say you would probably have the option to interrupt the repair if it was in a shop if you needed to get off planet quickly but there would be a lesser repaired component than if you'd have just left it till its full completion so it sounds like you can do quick fixes in space get it to a decent health or repair state but then you've got to take it to a shop to get it sort of fixed up to i wouldn't say brand new but a, a much better quality than what you could have done on your own so the next question, quite a nice question, is if I'm a lousy shot but I want to help my friends out in the middle of a battle, could I grab a wrench and keep the ship floating in a tough spot? And they say, hopefully, they say repair will be quite involved. You can bring components pretty much back from the brink of death. And you can also overclock components. This is something they talked about a while ago where you can only think it's very much like Firefly where you can probably get your power plant to put out more power for a short period of time. Although this could damage the component slightly in certain areas, but very much like we saw on Firefly where the lady engineer, I forget her name now, put it in the comments. She pushes it when the reavers are sort of closing in on them. And they say that you can really contribute to the fight even if you're not firing one of the weapons or fire flying the ship. They say you'll never just be a guy tagging along. There's always some Something you can do to help out. So next question is, in more traditional space combat sims, ships would automatically repair certain subsystems when given enough time after they were damaged. Will Star Citizen have this? And they say probably not, which I believe is good. A good thing, I don't think things should self-repair. But they did say you the closest thing would probably be with the repair drone, which you get. I think one of them was a stretch goal, but obviously you can buy them for your hangers, regardless where you can give it commands to repair, sort of light work. It won't do a top-notch job, but it'll get it to a certain standard, and it will allow you to focus on something maybe more important. They did say that repair bots won't likely have an initiative, so you can't just park your, your, your ship in the garage and say, there you go, she's all yours. It will need commands. 
And also, a little point they wanted to, to mention is that you will need to be stopped in space if you are doing it while in space, if you are repairing your ship in space. It cannot fix at high speeds, which it makes perfect sense. You can't sort of be flying around at 300 meters a second and chuck him out hoping he's going to fix a panel. It'll just... I don't know what will happen to him, poor thing. So, next question is, will we be able to take hull panels off of a ship and replace them with different materials? Sort of armor-esque, I, I assume. And they say, this will require you to visit a vendor to change out armor. It's more involved with ship structural integrity rather than repair itself, but you will not be able to fabricate higher armor grades in, in the field, so it will need to be taken to a shop. So, next one. Will some missions ask players to transport perishable goods like food? Will there be a time limit on delivery and will this require require the use of specialized cargo containers again nothing to do with repair but it's still a very decent question and they say yes they will have containers that are for perishable goods dangerous goods radioactive goods volatile goods and also livestock goods which will have their own life support built in plus anything else they feel they will need they will add to it at a later date so there are going to be a hell of a lot of different things to transport it isn't just going to be weapons and you know god knows whatever else there is so second to last question is will the crucible repair ship be necessary to get say a Bengal carrier back up and running and also get it to a safe place to fix it up now they say that a, a crucible alone so a single crucible would not do it for the Bengal you would need quite a few crucibles and they also said that in order to take out a Bengal carrier it would need to take a lot of damage so that would be a hell of a lot of hull breaches hull damage component damage which they say the crucible can actually fix and repair better than you can do it by hand they say, though, they're limited with cargo space and some Bengal components are actually bigger than the Crucible can carry. So you're not really going to be able to use a Crucible to take it anywhere safe. It's going to have to be done while in space, while in the dangerous territory of wherever it is that it's been blown up, to get it back to a reasonable standard to move it. They did say you would need about two to three Crucibles as a minimum to take care of a capital ship. So if you're on a capital ship like a Javelin or an Idris, don't think one Crucible will be enough to keep it floating. They say one Crucible would probably be enough for a constellation. So that gives an idea of how big the crucible is likely to be. The final question is, how will we know if an enemy player ship is hostile or has hostile intent before getting fired upon? Will there be an in-game process to identifying an enemy? For example, a wax uh, like the Hornet Tracker. And they say it's a matter of scanning. So this will determine how well you can identify ships and the tracker has better resolution than your average ship, hence what it's used for. They say if you are in close enough proximity, you should be able to tell if a ship has their weapons powered. Whether or not we'll be able to tell if that means they're hostile or not, I don't think so because if I'm flying through space, I, I will likely have my weapons switched on anyway, just to be safe. And they did mention that if you're in a bigger ship, it's better to have someone dedicated to scanning as keeping track of it is actually going to be pretty hard and you'll need to determine whether they're hostile or passive and mark each one or you can mark each one that you see so depending on what judgment you make from the facts you are given you will have to mark them as whether or not they're a threat or not which if there's tens of ships out there it can get quite confusing and difficult to keep control they did say that they want to balance the sort of pirate versus defenders sort of role so it's not going to be super easy for pilots to for pirates sorry to attack you and it isn't going to be super easy for you to determine if it's a pirate and just keep out of its way or fire first and currently they are revisiting the hood and and how you interact with it, hoping to make it easier to track targets and get more detail. Also, getting the information on people and sharing it with your friends is a big deal to them. So, if you are in a fleet or with a group of players, you won't be, or you won't likely be the only guy who is on the scanning desk as other ships in your fleet may be scanning as well. And then you can share it between yourselves. This is exactly what the, Her the Herald's for as well. If you have a Herald, it'll be able to determine probably quicker, more intently what the intention is of the of other people. Anyway, that was 10 for the designers some really cool stuff there and i'm hoping that with this indication to repair mechanics they're going to give us a deep dive on repairing engineering is a, is a role i would love to play and i'm very excited for it tell me your thoughts on everything mentioned put it in the comment so next up is around the verse episode 51 nothing special about this episode we've had the 50th it's back to normal again here is the empire report Senator Kyle Polo's controversial bill sparked a firestorm of debate since its introduction in the Senate. We'll talk with a senior military analyst who believes this bill, if passed, could signal the death of the UEE. Somebody call an exterminator. Anyone who's been to Vega 2 will know that Neela bugs can be a nuisance. But we'll show you one home that has to be seen to be believed. Sad news from the entertainment world. Arthur Vinn, the original voice of Rory Nova, passed away earlier tonight during emergency surgery. He was 137. A 
All that and more on the next Empire Report at 2200 SET. So, so from there, they explained that there's still no date for the FPS module, but it is coming. There was a little bit more Starliner footage, so I'll just show that up there. It's a shame. We're still waiting to see about the FPS, but I would prefer it to be completely polished to the point that it's not going to keep crashing or being buggy. So I'll let it be for now. Anyway, news from around the verse. CIG Santa Monica. Travis has gone. He has now taken on a job with Blizzard. It is very unfortunate. I believe he was actually a very good asset to CIG, but it is what it is. Anyway, they say the devs have been in game with players looking for things needing balancing they say the boost feature there it's sort of overused where you can sort of boost out the way all the time apparently i thought it was actually quite a useful technique apparently not and they say they're limiting the boost to about five to ten boosts a minute which if they make it in fiction to make sense then fair enough but so be it also zane is working on the merlin hood it is unique because it's not attached to your helmet it's attached to the dashboard like in a race car on to Ilphonic, and they say CIG are helping with animations. They say they've got a guy from Santa Monica come down to help get the animations. Over to Ilphonic, they say they've got a couple of people from Santa Monica CIG helping with animations, especially in the cases of the starts, stops, and jukes. They say they're having trouble with it. They've been making changes to the Gold Horizons for balancing, and it was to do with the refill areas for your ammo. They only had one refill area, which was, they say, kind of difficult to get re your ammo refilled. So they're adding more, just so it's a bit more easier for people to get their ammunition or their energy also they're putting in sightline blockers which a sightline blocker is to stop people looking all the way down the map so it's ideal for snipers basically if they can camp at one end although you're a sniper you're gonna camp it's just sniping and shoot all the way down to the other end of the map so they're, they're putting blockers to stop snipers having too big an advantage and also they're set dressing and just cluttering up the place to make it look more interesting and sort of clearing things out of the main pathways so that the gameplay can be a bit smoother otherwise you're forever knocking into things on to CIG and Austin they say they've wrapped up the starter ball characters the suits and the helmets and this is the first that they've done from scratch to complete this is to do with the new character pipeline so it's the first time it's ever gone from start to finish it's done they're also nailing down near-term animations for the social module the fps module squadron 42 they're getting it all done all ready to be mocap so foundry 42 in the uk didn't really make quite a lot of sense and it wasn't the best presentation they say squadron 42 one guy said he's working on vs i don't really know what vs is so please put it in the comments and the other guy is working on other levels and that was pretty much all i got from that so anyway ship shape with lisa rohan and she's talking about the Drake Herald Progress. Drake themselves as a company are known for cheap but well-armoured vehicles. They are favourite for pirates. The Herald is small, again well-armoured Intel type ship which is used for transporting information. It has powerful engines for data transfer and protection. And they showed us some concept and work in progress images. It's now symmetrical because it's better for flight. They say currently they are streamlining the Herald and tying it in for persistent universe functionality. The streamline is sort of protected compartment for landing struts and antenna and the functionality for the position universe is that enough room for data modules and power plants they say it's quite challenging because the cockpit is so narrow fitting all the seats and the workstations and living quarters is proving quite difficult they did show us a little work in progress of antenna and the alternate options that they chose from i do love these ship shapes tell me your thoughts about the herald i'm not a big fan of it i must admit it's not something that excites me it looks kind of grotesque but it's growing on me i don't know Tell me your thoughts. Anyway, James Pugh interviewed Randy Vasquez. He is actually the one that was working on the Genesis Styliner, which is his first ship he's ever worked on. And he did mention during this interview that there was an idea from the from the community about a casino version, which he did like. So who knows? We may see one. I also think the 890 Jump would make a good casino. Just saying it. So the Persistent Universe team took an interest in this ship and they did try and give some direction as to what they would like for the future. As this ship is very driven by the Persistent Universe, it's quite an important ship for the PU. He did mention they are not done with it and the community has given a lot of good feedback but just so you know all those sim pods that we saw in the white boxing they are placeholders they are not the actual seating for first class i must stress so also this week we are having the starliner q a that is coming up soon we've got one part so far this is friday so there may be another part to come there will be no reverse the verse as it has been the independence day celebration so happy independence day america tell me what it's like i've never been in america in independence day i would love to see it we will have have June's monthly report soon and the sneak peek is here. It is the Merlin in CryEngine and it does look a sleek sneak peek. Anyway, that was Around the Verse. Again, tell me all your thoughts on it. What did you like? What didn't you like? 
With the concept sale of the Genesis Starliner, we had a new Q&A post. There was two parts. Part one will be today, part two will be tomorrow, where they basically answer questions asked from the community about the Genesis Starliner. So the first question is, will you mainly transfer NPCs or players? And it says you can chart your own course there. They envision three types of Starliners. One being player run to transport NPCs as a business. Two being the NPC run to transport both players and NPCs. And then three being player run, but adapted to suit all different needs. But if you want to take NPCs or real players they could all buy a ticket from for you know for your flight next question is how modular is the Starliner can it be adapted to multi-role or is it more of a defined role ship and they say the interior is designed in compartments so it's very modular chassis limits mean it may not suit all roles like combat missions but there are plenty of other careers it can be used for beyond passengers so third question is does it have an onboard defense system maybe auto turrets or heavy armor and it says that currently borders will be repelled by the crew like on any other ship with the customizability though you have rooms to install additional defenses and it's pretty sturdy and heavy so they expect it will have decent armor but they do not expect it to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with a dedicated fighter weapons are designed to keep attackers at bay and not destroy them however if you were to swap out your size 5 hard points for an amazing gunner then they see no reason why it wouldn't take out a few ships with sort of well-placed shots it does have a large power plant to feed the shields and redundant systems that would not necessarily be present on a normal ship so it has its swings and roundabouts there so next question how much difference is there between the luxury starliner and the a90 jump they say the a90 jump is a yacht with extra fancy features whereas the starliner is more of an efficient transporter ship not meant for speed and comfort but you can outfit the starliner with staterooms but they will differ in efficiency speed and modularity to the a90 jump so pretty much similar but yeah the a90 is more of a luxury yacht thing that you can if you've got the spare cash you can buy one so the next question is are the variants mentioned officially announced and they say that the ones that they they mentioned exist in the fiction and they do hope to build out all of them down the line they will likely not have a variant launch where you can buy different variants but they will premiere them as and when they're needed and they say they are very excited for the military version as am i so moving on will these modular crew passenger compartments be available for all ships with the modular room support for example could you turn a caterpillar into a starliner and they say they anticipate the internal compartments will swap between multiple ship types not just or just like the external components they say sizing will prevent some pairing though but adding a stateroom or individual npc seats to another ship type is possible they don't want to have to build loads of unique rooms for every ship which is understandable and they say they can't speak for the caterpillar just yet but they have some cool ideas in the works so next question how well does the starliner fly in atmosphere and they say it will function both in atmosphere and space equally they designed a method by which it lands at a spaceport using VTOL fans on the wings and there's an image sort of showing those fans there so next question how does the starliner fare up against the connie karak 890 jump recliner and Idris in terms of speed quickness and maneuverability they explain it's not a racer the starliner is no racer so at cruising speed it would be somewhere in the middle range but with the amount of power and the number of main engines it can get up and go when needed so next question is will any of the ships be able to be carried by the starliner or is there any docking rings for carrying snub fighters and they say there's no promises yet but they're looking into it they say they don't want every ship to become a carrier but i think things like this need to have their own ships maybe even those little shuttles to get people on and off if they need to go or they they you know you need to ferry them down to a planet there are so many reasons why they should be able to have a couple of ships it doesn't have to be a carrier it just needs to carry a couple of defense ships anyway next question is can you make a firefly type ship with the starliner and how efficient is it for staying out in space for extended periods of time they say it's designed with the long range travel in mind so extensive backup systems towards crew and passenger safety are in place but in terms of the firefly they say that would be up to you so next question is about the cargo and it is, is the 403 cargo capacity listed separate from the passengers mentioned in details and it says the 403 includes the passenger cargo storage which is sort of classed as overhead bins as well as the main cargo hold which is below the decks they say it does not include the space used by people on the mid deck if all seats and cabins were removed it would increase beyond 403 so if you wanted to you could probably remove all that make it into a cargo ship if you truly love the starliner so next question is is there any exclusive equipment for the starliner only or can a variety of ships be fitted to fill a starliner role they intend that many ships can 
fit the role if desired, and will pursue this by making extra seats on existing spacecraft for NPC travel. Passengers will likely be more interested in boarding a dedicated transporter like the Starliner than buying a ticket as a passenger on a freelancer, for example. But they expect there will be always people to move around the galaxy, so it doesn't matter if you're a Starliner or a freelancer, you can ferry people about at your, your leisure. So the next question is, why does the... I'm nicknaming it Genstar, by the way. Genesis Starliner needs so many power plants. You heard it here first. Can you give some insight and also on the two size seven shields? And they say it's designed to have redundant safety features. Shields are to help take the brunt of the attack of the main engines pushing to get away from the would-be attackers. If a part of the ship is damaged, then the secondary power plant kicks in as it needs to run the ship. All the system drains on power are necessary for this ship as they need to focus on keeping those shields up and powered. The engines running at full power, life support systems pumping and guns fired if under attack. So there's a lot of things, redundant safety features that won't kick in unless you are attacked or something goes offline. So last question for the part one. How viable is the Genstar for solo players? And they say it is intended to be viable for solo players but it will be fun to have a group together to use one but they know that solo players will also want to use one so if you're a solo player you can use them on your own but with NPC crew helping you I expect. So that was the first Q&A. The next Q&A will be tomorrow's episode. Tell me your thoughts on what was mentioned here. What are you happy about? What are you just, what are you unhappy about? Okay, so on a final note, we have affiliated with Razer as we feel they make excellent gaming products. And if you want to help our channel out, plus buy amazing hardware, use the link in our description and we'll get a little kickback every time a product is bought. So that's it for part one of Star Citizen Sunday. Don't forget part two will be up tomorrow for the rest of the Star Citizen news and information. Follow us on Twitter at SuperMacBrother, no S on the end, to keep up to date with what we are up to. Plus we often give away hangar flare. Follow me on Twitch, Brothers Ryan, and I shall see you in the verse.